What's the matter? You know, I was just feeling the blues at night mm-hmm. when I leave work sometimes. Because? It's just been finishing late, you know, just uh, long days. And I just feel empty when I walk through the old port. Welcome to Weird Feelings. Oh, you're feeling weird. It was weird. It's weird feeling. It's uh, weird, 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 weird feeling. Welcome to another episode of Weird Feelings. You're so far away today. I know, so are you. I feel like there's like a big space, uh, space between, between us. us. <laughs> I wonder. Do you hear do you hear something else in the room? Yeah, do you? A little giggle? <laughs> a little giggle? <laughs> Whoa, we got Whoa. another guest. We got a guest. Hey, it's Elliot. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> My Elliot. friend Elliot. Are we friends? Oh, my new friend Elliot. Let's <laughs> dive into it and figure this shit out. Welcome um, to the podcast, Elliot. Thanks, thanks, thanks for, for coming, being the first of the new season. That's it. <laughs> first guest of the first new season. Of the new thanks se- for coming. <laughs> now that they've seen you, get out. Get out of Bye. Here. Yeah. Bye. You have a different voice when we do this. I'm in podcast mode. I know. You have a podcast. You have a presenter voice. I also do this annoying <laughs> thing where I really do, well, and I get really like. You do that in real life too. Oh, well. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. I'm here to get exposed by my friends. Elliot, you're a good, really good friend of mine that I've known for how many years has it been now? At least mm, like. Nearly a decade. Nearly a decade. decade. Yeah, 2014. Because it's been me and Jacob been together. So. 2014. Wow. Okay. Yeah. That's longer than I've been friends with Johnny. So Johnny, take a back seat here. You're number two. <laughs> I've technically known you since Will was in high school. Are you getting competitive? No, I'm just, okay, I'm just, anyway. I'm just comparing facts. Right. <laughs> this is about Elliot, therapist extraordinaire. Mm, extraordinaire. Extraordinaire. Yeah. That's what I heard. You are a big nerd. Uh-huh. Yeah. Love Star Wars. Very much so. Would you say Star Wars is is like the IP like that you love the most? I don't know what IP stands for. Intellectual, Intellectual property. property. Oh, yeah. Uh, I like Star Trek kind of equally. There's different things I like mm. about each. Right now, I'm really interested in The Wheel of Time. That's what I'm currently reading my way through. Is that Star Wars or Star Trek? No, it's completely unrelated. It's oh, a okay. series of 14 books. Each one is like... 700 800 pages long oh my god that's too, oh, much, that's too much yeah it was me. written from like the <laughs> 90s and only finished in 2013 and the original author actually died and then they had to get someone he got he had can i think he had cancer and he uh i could be totally wrong on that one but he then found another author he liked and they, they worked together and he gave him all his notes and so he actually finished the books for him um, oh interesting yeah so in the, the last same like three, style yeah, exactly. And he had like all, it was supposed to be one book, but the new writer's like, there's no way I'm going to be able to get this done. So I, he broke it up into three. Hmm. So yeah. when's the movie coming out? They're, doing, <laughs> <laughs> they're actually doing an Amazon series and there's like a lot of. Uh, oh, that's what I, I've heard of it. The Wheel of Time, I guess. That's yeah. And like, if you watch the series, without having read the books, you're like, this is pretty good. I can get into this. But if you've read the books, they change so much from it. They're like, I don't know how they're going to actually finish this properly. Hmm. They won't. That's what studios do. Mm. They rush these movies, yeah. these books into movies, and then it sucks. Yeah. So essentially, I'm off. I'm wrong on the Star Trek Star Wars. Oh, no, but those really are the... Those I'm obsessed with the, yeah Star Wars. Okay. Uh, the Thrawn books are probably my favorite. Now, I just said this to you the other day. Mm-hmm. The interesting you know, link there is I feel like Thrawn is the most Star Trek character of the Star Wars universe. Yeah, and that he's like smart, smart, and actually like thinks things through, like plans and stuff. Yeah, Johnny, do you know who Thrawn is? You've heard of Thrawn? Is he a Klingon? No, we're talking, he's, he's, that's the thing. He's in the Star Wars mm-hmm. universe. Oh, is this, no, I have no clue. Who's he's Thrawn? a blue guy. Mm-hmm. He's a blue guy. Yeah, I like the guy that's like has the laser gun. Like he looks like a little dude, but I don't know who Thrawn is. The little guy with the laser gun. Is he yeah, Han Solo. No, not Han Solo. <laughs> he's not so little. <laughs> he's like a green guy. Grogu? No, not Grogu. But who's Thrawn? He's like he's like he's in this in He's he's in the Empire. Yeah. He's blue. Yeah, he's blue. He's actually a Chiss from the uh, unknown regions. Uh <laughs> what episode is he in? Uh he's in 
he was introduced in Star Wars Rebels in the actual like Star Wars universe. Before that, he there were three trilogy books that were written that were the first Star Wars books ever actually licensed by George Lucas and Lucasfilms um, in the 90s that continued on Star Wars after like the original trilogy ended. Mm-hmm. And people really liked them. The Heir to the Empire was the first one. And uh, it was like this... Star- it kicked off the Star Wars expanded universe. And then when Disney bought star wars they got rid of the expanded universe and the whole like 20 30 years of stories that had been written in comics in novel form uh to like make the new star wars trilogy that kind of ignored everything interesting he's also featured in um the mandalorian not like you don't the latest season of the mandalorian you don't see him as a character but you you hear him mention him. him Mm-hmm. See, I haven't started Mandalorian season three. Oh, it's, it's good. It's pretty good. I'll get it. there. I'll get there. Okay, that's cool. Very specific character. What do you like about the character? Because he's smart. Yeah, he's like Machiavellian, smart, like thinks everything through. Uh, like it's like one of the bad guys that you like love to hate, but you're also not sure if he's a bad guy. Mm-hmm. Is he like a reflection of you? Kind of, you know, oh, you know, like it's like, are we getting into? It? You know, <laughs> I'm, I, I'm, I'm the therapist Italian. now. Yeah. <laughs> Use the force, Use the force. Um, I'm more like Jar Jar Binks. <laughs> <laughs> Misa, no, no, my feelings. I don't know how to exactly. do a Jar Jar accent. <laughs> Pretty good. Um. Okay, so big nerd. I don't know what else would yeah, you... Yeah, that we got from that tangent that you're like, you like Star Wars. And I'm <laughs> yeah. like, Let me tell you all these Star Wars things. Well, like. but, you know, it turns out we're all big nerds here. Uh-huh. So yeah. you're in a you're in a safe space. Mm-hmm. Okay, anything else that you would say about yourself? If I go like work stuff, title, I'm a Dr. Elliot Morris, clinical psychologist. Doctor. Yes, official. Yeah. This is probably the smartest episode we've had. <laughs> <laughs> from all episodes i think <laughs> phd will do that <laughs> do you know that i have a phd in love and life dr catch love over here dr catch love mm. yeah i just feel like making like the seven-year-old what is the phd in tim love and life oh no but i was going with pretty huge dick oh. <laughs> <laughs> that's, that's seven-year-old answer <laughs> i mean i have a P- psd Pretty small, small dick. Dick. <laughs> or a document a document <laughs> well a psd that's yeah. like the photo- yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, photoshop yeah. file yeah i teach at concordia uh other than that yeah therapist in my own life and dog dad and dog dad yeah barney it's the dog this uh husband jacob uh <laughs> this is a husband check yeah just running through the things. Uh, yeah, I think that uh, sums me up. I mean, it's hard to sum up a person in an introduction, but yeah. those yeah. are some some key Those are big hits. Points. Keywords, keywords. Mm-hmm. Okay, now, interesting that you said that you're a PhD in clinical psychology. Mm-hmm. Well, we wanted to have you on here to talk mm-hmm. about our feelings because <laughs> this is weird feelings. Yeah. And I feel like you're a dealer of a dealer and wielder mm. and navigator of, of emotions. Yeah. yeah. Who better to have on the podcast? Do you also do your own kind of thing? Like your like a private practice? Yeah, so I have, a, I have my own private practice. I work at another one. Uh, at the other one that I work at, I do group and individual therapy on my own. I do a variation of that, but just individual. What's the okay. name? Shout out your... Oh, uh, Elm Clinic is just really my initials. <laughs> That's how that came to be. You got some You got Elm. some content? You got some socials? You got some... How do they reach you? Uh, I have a Psychology Today profile that people oh. can find me on. And then they send me an email. And then I also just get people, uh, other people I've worked with uh, or like trained with. So other people I know who are psychologists will send me referrals. People I've worked with will send other people they know to me and yeah that's kind of how it goes so you don't have uh instagram i do have an instagram but i don't you don't want to plug it uh it's the same it's i think it's clinic.elm he has Uh, a tiktok you have a tiktok (laughs) (laughs) those therapy dances (laughs) therapy is is a character (laughs) 
Oh, TikTok therapists are uh, the worst. Wait, is that a thing? <laughs> yeah, is that? A th- uh, there's lots of different TikToks, like, of people, like, psychologists on TikToks or therapists on TikToks who, like, post things and post advice and oftentimes... Like, I get what they're doing. I don't mean to knock it, although mm-hmm. it's basically what I'm doing. It can be ranging from wildly inaccurate um, to people will adopt it as a way to seeing themselves that doesn't end up being actually being helpful. Hmm. Right, because it's, it's like, how do you give therapy in a general sense, right? Like, yeah. How do you not deal on a person-to-person basis? Mm-hmm. Um, that makes, that, you know, the, there's like that, I think a Netflix show, or maybe it's like a documentary. Uh, what is it called? Stutz. Stutz with Jonah Hill. The yeah, one Jonah. Hill. So it's with Jonah Hill's it's therapist. One on one with his therapist, and they they have oh. a conversation. Yeah. Have you seen that? Stutz. Have you heard of that? Oh, Phil not. Stutz. That's okay. I think his name. It's very. It's like controversial because he's kind of like preaching, you know, a way for like here are tips and tricks that everyone can use. Mm-hmm. Maybe a more like general kind of approach. Yeah. Um, I don't know. It's like the, like it's drilled into us in training that everything is confidential. Like in Quebec, the first thing I say to people when I meet people is, before we talk about anything therapy, everything you say is confidential. There's three instances where I can break confidentiality without your consent. That's if you're in danger of harming yourself, others or their child or elder abuse. Like that is literally the first thing I say to everybody. And so for me, it's like I'd probably feel uncomfortable even if I had someone's consent to go and be with them in a studio and have it recorded and talked about it's like it kind of just like goes against right my training i don't know if i think it's it's more of a conversation between jonah hill and his therapist it's more (laughs) like jonah hill interviewing his therapist more Mm -hmm. than anything it's not really like a session yeah i feel so it's just more like they're talking about it Mm -hmm. but about like you know when there's like the crime like i've seen like, like yeah and then you guys can are you guys allowed to break that uh, clause? You know, it's like like it's like bring you to court to like test, it's like testify if for the murders. Someone's in imminent danger of harming somebody else. Then there's like a duty to protect. But the flip side of it is like, how do you know someone's in imminent danger of harming themselves or someone else? Or actually, the research shows we're really shit at predicting um, suicidality or even homicidality in people. It's such a in the moment emotional reaction to something that it's really we can figure out kind of warning signs or whatever it is, but you can't really tell what someone's going to do. Right. Unless someone's saying, like, I have this plan on this day and this time. And it used to be you're not uh, even then you weren't allowed to. They were the laws were changed because of uh, an incident that occurred. I think it was in Texas um, where. Uh, talked to his therapist about his plan to go and uh, murder some people and the therapist knew and the guy actually followed through with it and he didn't say anything um, Ooh. so the, the therapist didn't say anything yeah because legally he like at the time in their jurisdiction it was no it's confidential I'm not allowed to say anything okay and so that's what changed mm-hmm. uh that the so okay law. so if you know that someone's like hey I'm planning to go murder yeah Johnny yeah whoa on Friday, mm-hmm. on his day off, mm-hmm. <laughs> you're allowed to tell. You can go tell. Yeah, but I don't have confidentiality towards you. You're not my patient. No, I am. Um, if if I were your patient. Oh yeah, if I were right. patient, theoretically I would be. But on the other hand, like, why are psychologists held to that standard? Someone can go to a priest and say the exact same thing, and there's no laws regulating that. It's true. Someone could go to a priest and say the same thing. Yep. Catholic and... priest, anyway. Yeah, in the booth. And, the and you're saying the priest has no... Is not obliged to say anything. They cannot break the seal of the confession. Oh, really? No. Hmm. hmm. Interesting. So are you saying that uh, therapists should not have that rule or that law? Well, it go, and I'm not saying they should or shouldn't, but it goes along the lines of why are... Well, I'm a psychologist, not a psychiatrist. Psychiatry is the only branch of medicine that's also a branch of the law. Oh, which and when we're talking about disorder we're talking about psych- psychiatric conditions psychological conditions there's an assumption that's made that well it, it's a biological cause that is making this person be this way 
mm-hmm. right? When we talk about disease, when we talk about disorder. If we go outside of psychiatry into any other field of branch of medicine, it's, well, if you go to the doctor because you're not feeling well, strep throat, well, you have this infection, you have this virus, you have this disease, you have uncontrolled cell division and going beyond strep throat, obviously, with that. And we're saying, oh, there's a problem and find the problem, fix the problem. That's really the mandate of a doctor. Mm -hmm. But when you go to a medical professional because you're feeling emotionally unwell, there is no biological origin for any psychiatric illness, actually, when you go and do the research. Because it was originally, the DSM was originally intended as really just a diagnostic statistical manual for researchers. They can keep track of who people are being, who's being seen in mental institutions as they were in the 50s. Uh, People coming back from World War II, like veterans, and then uh, the Korean War and everything, all of that. It was intended as a document to help people and to keep track of people, but there's no biological origin to any psychiatric illness. There's post hoc things. You can look at, well, people who have a diagnosis of, say, for example, ADHD. Mm-hmm. Well, say that, oh, well, when we put them in an F- MRI or an fMRI or do a PET scan, we can see that, look, this person has a different brainwave patterns or activation, but is that chicken or is that egg? And I work from right. the perspective that I'll say emotion's not a disorder. And so I will say that the, the brain is plastic. We learn, we evolve, we change, we grow. And so I work from the assumption that everyone originally starts, okay, things happen and we develop reactions, develop responses to manage our emotionality, to manage the situation. Mm -hmm. And it makes sense at the time, but maybe it's not making sense now. And so I work from the frame and have been trained from the idea that emotions, not a disorder, that we all have emotions. We all experience it differently. And to view yourself as someone who is sick, who has a disorder, even though it makes sense, even though it's super validating, Mm -hmm. actually ends up hindering you because then, well, my behavior, what I'm doing, that's caused by my disorder and I have no control over it. It actually takes away your agency. It's like something, it's like uh, I'm born with this or it's something that's in me and it will never change and I can't work on it and it won't go away. Yeah, and so I work from the perspective of emotions, not a disorder. Let's leave the diagnosis at the door for 10 weeks and see what if I don't need that to define me, even though it makes sense, even though it describes my emotionality and mm-hmm. my behavior and everything. But maybe I can move beyond that. Maybe I don't need that to be okay. Maybe I can just be okay. Hmm. Hmm. You said a DSM. What is that? A Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders. Oh, okay. That's like a book. Yeah, it's currently <laughs> on its like fifth edition since the 50s. And it has a whole bunch of different things that have been added and removed over time right which then even speaks to the ridiculous of the things that are in there like for and i think it's the dsm-3 it's the one that has uh ego dystonic homosexuality as a mental disorder instead uh it has uh being trans as a mental disorder except in that one it says transvestitism uh (laughs) and it's under like psychosexual dysfunction and beneath it are things like um pedophilia and all these things so it's lumping people's sexual identity sexual orientation gender identity as saying well this is disordered and even in the current iteration there's uh what is it called gender dysphoria basically it's the same compromise that ego dystonic homosexuality was included in the dsm-3 to get people uh to get the gay communities like off psychiatrists back because they were saying that, well, you being gay is a mental disorder. Um, and gay people, lesbians, bisexual people were all being like, well, no, it's not. Um, <laughs> and protesting. And so there was a, a compromise made by saying, well, we'll put it as ego dystonic homosexuality, which just means that I am someone who's gay and is distressed by that. And okay. so then I can get right. therapy subsidized by my employer. Jeez, that's in volume. On that? like the, like the DSM committee. That, that's in volume three, and we're only at volume five. Yeah, wow. that's not that. How long ago is that? Uh, the DSM three, I think, is seventies, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, that's not that long ago. It's like, nope. It's like the Bible or something. It's like. Uh huh. And the DSM five has 
uh, gender dysphoria, which is basically the same compromise so that people who are trans can get surgery that's covered by um, uh, in, uh, insurance. Basically, it's more in the U.S. than here. The problem there being, though, that in order for me to have gender affirming surgery, I have to then say that I'm sick. Right. Okay. And get a diagnosis a that disorder. I have a mental disorder, and that's why I'm. I. Uh, that's mm. why I'm gonna be have surgery or whatever uh, hormones or whatever it is we're talking about in terms of gender affirming care. Jeez, tricky stuff. Yeah. Oh yeah. Oh God. Okay. Um. Actually, this is a question. This is something that I've found throughout my life that I've always struggled with. Which and it's super simple. It's probably the simplest thing. Mm -hmm. Can you define in simplest terms? The difference between a therapist mm -hmm. and a psychologist. You read my mind. I was thinking the same thing. So let's start with the ABCs. Yeah, ABCs. <laughs> Just put it on screen. Essentially, all psychologists can be considered therapists. All psychiatrists can be considered therapists. Psychiatrist is a medical doctor. They have an MD. A psychologist has a PhD. Um, you don't okay. need to have a PhD to be a therapist. You can also be an occupational therapist. The term psychologist was a protected term. For example, in Quebec, it wasn't until maybe, I want to say 2011, until it became a protected term, or maybe even before that, but you didn't need a PhD to be a psychologist for a long time. What do you mean by like protective term? Uh, you can't be called a psychologist unless you hold a license from the Order of Psychologists Quebec who says you are a psychologist. Okay. And you have to meet certain requirements to get one. Basically, <laughs> the most hilarious uh, requirement is step one to getting an OPQ license, a, a psychologist license, is mm -hmm. get a PhD. Like, <laughs> biggest <it. laughs> step ever um, to uh, get that. Get a PhD. That's not that hard, right? Uh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Only about six or seven years <laughs> of your life. Um, uh, okay. Then you, if you're from Quebec, uh, it becomes much easier. You do an application. If you register and are from here, it's a fairly simple process. Um, but they are the ones who decide you like that, that you get that piece of paper, that license number says you're a OPQ licensed psychologist. If you are someone who's calling yourself a psychologist, clinical psychologist, and doesn't have a uh, OPQ, um, license then, and you're saying I'm a psychologist, I'm a therapist and I'm practicing, mm -hmm. that's, uh, illegal. Basically you can be a psychologist and be a researcher. There's research psychologists, there's clinical psychologists. Um, but to be a clinical psychologist, you have to have a, a registered license. Okay. okay. And so is the other biggest difference so between the two, one as the medical doctor yeah. can prescribe? Yes. And do uh, psychologists also give therapy? Uh, psychologists do, yes, mainly do, only do therapy. Psychiatrists. Oh, sorry. See, that's the thing. Yeah. That's the yeah. thing that I always fuck up. Psych psychologists. Psychiatrists prescribe medicine. Psychi okay. they, do you know the origins of the word? Uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. I should look that up. I can tell you the uh, the origin of the word diagnosis, uh, which okay. is Greek. And it actually is a combination of two words that mean to know a part basically to um, know a part yes to split nature at its joint to say like oh. this is this and this is that which becomes the issue in psychology because it the reason why the dsm has been revised so many times which is psychiatry's issue actually not psychology's dsm-3 came out because the dsm-2 it was so unreliable the diagnoses that people were giving everybody mm -hmm. that the insurance people weren't going to cover it anymore. Like, well, why are you giving this for this person, this diagnosis for this person? And so the DSM-3 came along and it gave a radically different type of diagnostic method, which is more akin to um, other fields of medicine, except for it's symptomless. So saying this person does this, 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 experiences this, 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 therefore they have this. Okay. Um, and so it made diagnoses more reliable problem being in my opinion lots of psychologists and even some psychiatrists opinion is that if you were to go to a doctor because you have strep throat and they were to diagnose you mm -hmm. based off of symptoms only they would be practicing really bad medicine and make it called before a review committee whereas if you are um sorry why is why is that because 
you're saying someone has strep throat without actually giving them any test. You're not like taking. Oh, if they just look, just yeah, assuming. like look okay. at someone's throat. Oh yeah, you have strep throat, but actually give no test. That's fairly right. bad medicine. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. But if you go to a psychiatrist and they diagnose you on symptoms alone, that's good medicine, hmm. right? There's no actual test to give someone to say whether or not they have a mental illness. Right. I put that in air quotes for some reason. Um, <laughs> I'm Mental saying that people, illness. People who are listening. General disposition. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, that's not my uh, example. I took that from a book that I uh, have my students reading class called The Book of Woe uh, called by Gary Greenberg. It's one of the things he opened with in his book. But it is really striking, right? It's like you go to a psychiatrist or even a psychologist and they'll diagnose you based only on symptoms. Hmm. Mm. So what do you, so what do they do? Like how do you, since you can't do a test, how do they... That's just how it is? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Is there ever the case, is that something that uh, would ever be like, okay, I've I've evaluated you and I think that that could maybe help. I need to send you? Uh, there's lots of psychologists that do. I tend not to. Okay. Because, I again, I work from the idea that you're not disordered. You have emotions and let's learn how to manage them differently and we're going to get you to not depend on anything. That's not to say that medication isn't helpful. Right. No, it does something. In the long term, it, you tend to get diminishing returns. Our body wants to be, it, like our main goal is homeostasis, right? Come back to just being chill and okay mm -hmm. in all the ways, biologically, psychologically, emotionally. That's kind of the goal. I mean, everyone just wants to feel okay. That's yeah, yeah for sure. So your body tends to do that with any type of medication. You get diminishing returns because you adapt, you adjust to it. Mm. Once you stop taking it, then you get a, a fall off and you start having withdrawal symptoms from whatever you're doing. Oh boy, I saw so, that very recently from someone that I know that I want. But see, to. that's something that like, for me, like I, I don't believe in like taking mm -hmm. pills and stuff to get like, to a certain place, I mm -hmm. feel like I need to be in my feelings more than anything yeah. and understanding them. And I feel yeah. like that's the best way. Yeah, I'm actually trying to have it both ways. Really, that's what I'm doing. I'm trying to do a balancing act. Like, I'm not trying to knock medication. It actually really is helpful yeah. for lots of people. And also, it's usually not the long term solution because people who do take medication a long time suffer from lots of side effects. Right. right? Like, maybe you won't feel as depressed but you're also not wanting to have sex you've gained weight you feel lethargic you feel really tired all the time mm -hmm. and that's usually the reason why people want to get off the medication yeah. i say to the people let's go to the gym oh, God. <laughs> this is johnny's classic <laughs> if, if, well. if johnny were a, me, a therapist he'd be like yeah you ain't got yeah, problems yeah, just yeah, go well there is something some to that in that the, your body does release lots of endorphins and research shows that mm -hmm. 45 minutes of vigorous ex exercise is as effective as taking an antidepressant. Um, see, Tim, see? <laughs> but that also, like, for some people is really helpful and for some other yeah. people may not be the solution. I think that's the thing. Like, mm -hmm. everyone's super different, so... You yeah, know, it works for me, like, really well. Mm -hmm. But obviously, not everyone is you, so for others, they that might not work. Of course. Or maybe not they're not... They're not able, they're, or they're not able to work out. They don't have the time, or they're, you know, yeah. whatever the case may be. Um, it seems for me like it seems like um, medication is potentially something that can give you like a leg up, mm. or like a pause, or like yeah. a moment of let's say calmness, or whatever you want to call it, like mm -hmm. homeostasis. I think that's what you said. Mm -hmm. Big words. Um, yeah, I got lots of those lying around. <laughs> put, put the word. Yeah. Home homeostasis. <laughs> word of the day. <laughs> <laughs> that could, like you said, kind of get someone somewhere mm -hmm. so that they can then work on yeah. the issues that are. Yeah, you know. it can be helpful. And then uh, there was like a recent meta analysis done. Um, uh, I can't remember by who it was in nature. And it was looking at the what the serotonin myth basically um oh. the idea right everyone talks about oh i need more serotonin i need yeah. more dopamine and the reason why it's prescribed why do we give people uh medication that will uh, serotonin selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors ssris we give them to people because if you give that to anyone it's gonna have an effect and there's the assumption of psychiatry is that well when we give someone this medication well then people feel better and so there must be some type of imbalance chemical imbalance there must be a yeah. lack of something but you actually can't test someone you can't actually look at someone's neurons and see how much serotonin do you have it's actually not possible so it's an assumption why and can't we do that yet 
I don't think we'll ever be able to do that. There's billions of billions of neurons and connections in our body, in our brain. You're never going to actually be able to measure the amount of serotonin in a, uh, in someone's, uh, neur- neurons because it's down to that. Uh, what, what level is that again? That's molecular uh, molecular. Right. Right. You can't test for that. It's yeah. also when you can test in the, in your blood levels. No. Oh, okay. And so it's, it's an assumption that because you lack serotonin, uh, that there's a chemical imbalance and that's why you suffer. But if you give anybody, uh, any type of, um, medication Mm -hmm. they're gonna see a difference but there's research that shows that long-term serotonin use um or that serotonin hypothesis is incorrect is that partially because it kind of like starts to decrease your own ability to create to like produce serotonin and at this point my my knowledge uh runs out (laughs) okay (laughs) well i won't continue to you know (laughs) had you asked me in the fall when i read the paper i've been like this 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 right yeah Students no, forget sense. stuff after class yeah. and the teachers do sometimes too. <laughs> um, okay. Okay. Interesting. Interesting. Would you say that you do a specific type? I use, it's like a more eclectic form of therapy. I use like the tools and skills from lots of different forms. So there's lots of different like alphabet soup therapies, CBT, DBT, ACT, psychodynamics, psych, uh, emotion focused therapies, so on and on and on and on and on. Okay, lots of different stuff. Yeah, yeah there's, there's lots of different things. Um, I uh, do a skills based like approach to therapy that pulls from everything. So, okay. uh, what are the skills and tools that are going to help you to manage your emotions differently? Mm. This is a silly question, but mm. I love those. Do you think that everyone needs therapy? Not everyone needs therapy. Or should have or should try therapy. If you're suffering with something, then yeah, it's probably helpful. Um, Well, let's say people, you know, because certain people, hey, let's say myself. mm. (laughs) um, I love obviously talking about my feelings. I Mm -hmm. love talking to my friends, my family. I'm like an open book on that in that sense. Mm -hmm. I would I think I'd honestly love doing therapy Mm -hmm. i love talking to you about all different things but i don't have any sense of need or desire to necessarily go and talk about anything specific that's like Mm -hmm. bothering me yeah so i guess my thing would be i probably so for me it doesn't make sense to go to therapy whereas other people are you know might say like no you probably do have issues you should probably go one way or the other well, that speaks more. If they're saying that to you, that speaks more about them than it does about you because that's oh. their shit. Um, oh. If you're not suffering, then you don't need to. If you're suffering with something or you want to change something, it could be really effective. Right. right. There's lots of therapists out there. I'm a very changed focused therapist. I do short term therapy with people, very specific, very structured over 10 to 12 weeks. Um, with people, the research shows that most therapy is effective within 12 weeks after that. Again, you get diminishing returns. So I work with people short term. I still, do, I do follow-ups as well. Like I some, see some people once a month or for a while and then I don't see them for a bit and they send me an email. Hey, I'm struggling with something. Can we mm-hmm. meet? Yeah, I'll meet you once, twice, three times again and then taper off and you email me when needed. But I do very structured therapy with people with a goal to, okay, let's, we're going to get you to understand yourself different and be different and be more okay in your life. And so there's less of a mess for you. Um, some people, there's lots of therapists that don't do that, right? They'll sit and I'm not, again, it sounds like I'm knocking it. I don't mean to be. Um, there's lots of therapists who will sit and talk and explore emotions and what's going on, but you can feel maybe like it's not changing. Some people it's really helpful for and there's lots of areas where that is relevant we're talking like things like grief therapy grief counseling that's a time when no let's understand the emotions i work from the frame of like okay let's reduce some of the emotionality and when you're grieving someone that is a process and the way that i work with people it usually isn't effective i've met with people or had consultations with people who were like their spouse had died two days before the consultation and i was like i could help you but you're right now i'm not the person you need you need to explore and like process that grief differently right, i'm gonna right. get you to like just be okay and not need to uh to have that emotionality as much right some people need someone there 
that they can just kind of like yeah spill the beans to feel heard feel yeah. like understood and your approach is a little more like yeah let's figure this out and let's get you somewhere yeah exactly right and there's is like, that a sorry to, to cut you yeah. off but is is that common within i know you're saying like some mm, people are not just, really <laughs> okay yeah like there is a place for for both but it, it, like if you want to change the let's meet every week and talk and vent and like dump it all out you're not going to necessarily change with that. And then you kind of end up building a dependency on that person. Well, I need to see my therapist and like get this out. That's like how I see like the same kind of therapy that I do in mega quotations Mm -hmm. of talking to my friends, my family, just like sometimes you just need to dump and like tell people how you are feeling. Yes. And that alone can make you feel better. Yeah. And so I can see obviously value in that uh if you don't have that in your life if you don't feel comfortable mm-hmm. or if you don't have friends or family that you feel comfortable talking yeah. to totally get like going yeah. to a therapist and yeah. and spilling the beans but i i like the idea of if i'm paying yeah <laughs> to go see someone uh we have like steps to take and there's like a process and i'm not just like well guess i'm in therapy now yeah. and that's what i need to survive right? yeah but not saying that there are, you know, maybe just people, maybe some people don't have or will never have those kind of people in their life. Yeah. Friends, family, whatever. So maybe they do need like a therapist for life. I would say what I have this one of my old supervisors uh, while doing a PhD. Uh, uh, she's very funny and I like her a lot. Uh, she would say to people, you weren't born with a therapist in your pocket. You don't need a therapist mm. in your pocket. Actually, you need to, you need to be able to manage on your own. Basically, the idea is like, you don't need me. You were born with me. I'm always going to be here. You can send, you can meet with me, but actually you need to learn how to manage your own shit on your own and be, then be different. I like that. Mm. Yeah. I have lots of collections of different sayings from lots of different <laughs> supervisors over the years. So when you get into therapy mode Mm -hmm. um and you've done this to me so i know that this is a thing (laughs) i've heard about this what do you like with your with your students why do i keep calling them students because i have students too oh that's true patients um you mean like clients patients whatever yeah. yeah how are are you like friendly are you an open book do you talk about yourself are you like hey how's it going no because i'm not your friend why not if i was your friend well, then I'm not going to be able to say shit to you that needs to be said or that you maybe you're paying me to hear because then I'm going to care about what do you think about me? Mm. Do you like me? Do but I want my therapist to like me. That's because you want to have lots of people like you, Tim. Uh, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Who doesn't yeah, want everyone course. to like them? Of course you want people to like you, but you don't need people to like you. I don't need it. You don't yeah. need it, Tim. You don't need to. You could right. want it, but you don't need it. I don't yeah. like you, Tim, actually. That's okay. <laughs> I'm totally fine with that. <laughs> um, okay, so you keep it very, like, it's non-personal. Yeah, on purpose. So, right. like, me, my face, like, really doesn't even move. I get that from one of my uh, supervisors as well, who I trained with, was like, no, this is how you're going to work with me for the year. And before that, I'd actually kind of, I kind of used to do that as well, just non-reactive to people. And I had a different supervisor. It's like, no, like, how could you do that? You need to make that connection with people. Right. And so I've had, like, I've done both sides. And actually, at the end of the day, a lot of people will talk about how you need to feel a connection with your therapist. You need to be, it's relational and you need to be connected. Whereas in reality, like, no one's ever going to understand you. No one's ever going to understand you the way you want to be understood. Sorry, Tim. I'm never going to understand you 100% the way you want to understand me. Fuck. <laughs> I, just want ever, I just want everyone to get me. I know. And it's not possible. A therapist <sighs> will get close. A partner will get close. A parent is not by a thousand miles ever going to get close to understanding <laughs> you the way you want to be understood. And that is a lot of both what happens in therapy is talking about that. <laughs> right. Um, and so. That's a good point. You actually don't need to have anything in common with your therapist because your therapist understands emotion and that's the thing everybody has in common and that's the thing what they can help you with right so to aid in that from what you've told me you do you have like your 
therapy face yeah which is basically like can we do it can we do it yeah, a, 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 can we do it so like as if i'm talking <laughs> to you and then like you'll do it where you like turn it on i think for the most part <laughs> i've been doing that uh well we've been doing this because i kind of just i'm looking up You're at the ceiling i'm not looking at anyone so my face is just kind of bland and not <laughs> uh, moving but yeah for the most part actually it's just more like this like my face doesn't really move so how about we do a little scenario yeah. where let's say let's get johnny involved johnny this is your first therapy session mm-hmm. this is not disclaimer this is not, not real therapy, therapy. do not yeah, take yada, it as a yada 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 this yada, is yada. uh reenactment yeah all right johnny you're in therapy gotta control my face and one sec no hold on it's not there oh. yet now i'm laughing hello doctor <laughs> i'm not here hello doctor <laughs> i'm Did not they call here you doc? no wait, what you, what? uh no i tell i i introduce myself yeah. i'm dr elliot morris call me elliot just okay. right off the bat and action confidentiality no 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 all that, all that jazz. I'll put a like big that. disclaimer yeah. around this everything. This is not real therapy. Yeah, I'm an actor. Yeah, I'm a comedian. Yeah, <laughs> what's the matter? You know, I was just feeling the blues at night mm-hmm. when I leave work sometimes because it's just been finishing late. You know, just uh, long days, and I just feel empty when I walk through the old port at night. Hold oh, this from a slice of gabagool. I have to be looking at you. Actually, it's weird oh, yeah. for me not be looking at you. All right. Let me see your face. Hello. Hi. Hi. Oh, I see the face now. Mm-hmm. Come on, Johnny, give us some stuff. Yeah, but just been walking around, just uh, feeling like uh, not fulfilled. Just uh, late nights. What's that like? Just feels, uh, just feels sad. Yeah, what's sadness? What's that like? It's a lot of, that's really, I need to think about that one. It's pretty, it's pretty empty. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, right? A feeling is actually a thing that you feel. People talk about feelings as emotions, as thoughts, but no, that's actual physical feeling. When you feel sad, you feel empty. Yes. You have thoughts that go along with it, and you have emotion that will label it, but ultimately that's what it ends up feeling like. I'm kind of scared of you now. (laughs) (laughs) I think that's what Tim said one time. I I was at your place. We were at like a a dinner. very drunk. And we'd been drinking a bit, and you told me about this face thing. And I was like, hey, you got to do it for me. And just all of a sudden, you know, we're laughing and smiling. You got you got a big, nice smile. Mm-hmm. And all of a sudden it just goes like. Yeah. And you're like staring <laughs> into my soul. Mm-hmm. And it is a little. But I guess it gets to a point where like if I, I'm the patient and then I see that. Mm-hmm. It, you get to a certain comfort. Like, oh, they, like this is real. Like, yeah. I have to like open up and. And they're not going to fucking react to whatever. Yeah, I'm if saying. you were like, "Hey, yeah, what's up, dude?" <laughs> You'd be like, "Okay, this is kind of bro, too broy, or whatever." Right. I could see someone maybe feeling like, let's say you're saying, a, telling them something that's sad about yourself, and they're mm-hmm. not like reacting, and you're like, "Wait, does this person not understand me or get me?" Or mm-hmm. yeah, but. Right, it's something that I also make explicit with people after, like in right. one of my sessions. It's actually the third session. I tell people, I make explicit. No, my face doesn't move because no one owes anything. Anything you can't make me feel, I can't make you feel. I'm going to replicate that with you. You can't make me feel anything, so my face isn't going to move because yeah. that's your shit, not my shit. Uh, and if you're right. telling me about something that's really sad in your life or that you're upset about or is that's that's traumatic if my face is like oh my god that's so bad i'm so sorry for you well then you have a reaction too yeah. then you go oh i feel embarrassed i feel ashamed i feel whatever mm. and then oh, you feel I the see. need to take care okay. of me which is the reverse that's not what's happening right but when you okay really. so like, you know when you're when you have a new patient going mm-hmm. into the therapy do you expect them to be the one coming up and being open to open up as much or you have to kind of like dig a bit by asking those questions uh well i start with a very open-ended big question that i did with you what's the matter it kind of gets right to the point it's true what is the matter i don't have that feeling anymore though that i know i fixed it oh as in you had that feeling before yeah i've told you about. i feel like you should definitely go talk to someone <laughs> i've done I've, I've been to therapy for anxiety yeah but even in so even in this little play thing that we did i'm i am sensing as a friend uh, uh like there's an un, like i feel like you're uncomfortable talking about like opening up and talking about certain things. me yeah i think you are you too you are what I'm telling you to go to therapy and try it out too. And you're like, oh, I'm like Mr. Know-it-all. I just try to do it all. Right. 
Hey, you know what? I had a, a recent realization mm. uh, that I might need to go to therapy. Because? To talk about my mom. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It's usually what it's about. It's usually what Not it's about. Not my mom. mom, mom dad or dad. Too. Yeah. Or but both. I have a feeling that, that like, I think I know myself pretty well. Mm-hmm. And I think I know a lot of, like, I'm, I feel like a very ov- almost, like, too self-aware person. Mm-hmm. But I think there are things that I'm not aware of. Such as? Ways that I act, ways that I behave, um, reactions in certain situations, like things that trigger me, things Mm. that make me kind of flip out or whatever. Usually things in relationships Mm -hmm. um, that I have a feel that I'm starting to understand might stem from how I was brought up specifically in relation to my mom. Mm Mm-hmm. Oh. Yeah. Does your mom watch or listen to this podcast? Uh, she she knows about it. I never... <laughs> uh, I shared it with her and she... I don't think she ever listened to it. Except for the one episode that is... Uh, the one where I'm raging Tim because she was having a bad day and I'm like, listen to this. This might make you feel better. <laughs> and she loved it. She's like, it's hilarious. Nice. Uh, but other than that, she doesn't listen, no. Mm. So you have something to How say? How do you know? I don't know. Hey, mom, if you're listening, hi. Sure also, you're-, you're the problem. <laughs> <Apparently>. <laughs> but uh, but but here's the thing. I've been I mean, she doesn't know that I've had this thought, but mm-hmm. like I've been very open recently and having conversations with her about mm-hmm. about the past and things like that. And mm-hmm. like, you know, and I've said spe- specifically to her, like everyone is a product of their past. Like. My mom is a product of all of her experiences mm-hmm. and how her parents brought her up. Yeah. As am I, as my dad is, as everyone mm-hmm. is, I think, to some degree. Yeah. So it's not something that's like specific to my mom mm-hmm. if my mom is like uh, a cause for any of how I am. It's not her fault. It's like, no. it's not her fault. It's not her parents' fault. It's no one's fault. It's just, just how, how it, it is. is. Yeah. 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 See, I already got to figure it out. But- <laughs> No, but you are. I do feel like you are a bit self-aware too. Like I, I, I became more self-aware where I know what my feelings are. Like, for example, for anxiety, I know that I get a certain way, mm-hmm. and that if and, and I've noticed that feeling where it's like if it shuts down and I'm like I can't do anything, I just overthink it. Mm-hmm. So I, I've I've been to that deep end, and I, I know it now. So that now I've been just trying to rework it and just re- remembering those feelings, how to go about it. Mm-hmm. Because I did one like like three four sessions with a therapist about that anxiety, and then it's like, mm-hmm. well, it was literally telling me like, well, what's gonna happen? What's the worst that can happen? I'm mm-hmm. like, then I'm like, yeah, that's right. Like, what's what's gonna happen? Like, yeah. I, I can't control it. Yeah. And then when it, once that clicked in my brain, I was like, yeah, I just go with it now. Mm-hmm. So self aware. <laughs> 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 I want to know your thoughts about. I've been looking like in like different type of therapy like psilocybin and like ketamine therapy like i've been reading a bit about it but i want to know like what do you think about that like that i guess it's like new i really actually know not that much about it just to say so johnny you're talking about um psychedelics psychedelics yeah yeah. in relation to because it feels like it's like a new thing like people are like it's new in canada too like it's getting yeah like there's research on it there's not a lot of research on it so okay like lots of people like kind of jump on the bandwagon, but again, uh, yeah, is it like a trend? Or? Yeah, but all like there are some research shows that like a, a there was one study it was like a trial where one like specific dose of psilocybin, basically mushrooms, um, will is as effective as therapy for significantly reducing depression. Um, okay. Again, that is going along with the hypothesis that there is some kind of biological uh thing that's right. causing it okay, yeah. take the medicine take the pill yeah. you're fixed kind yeah. of thing take the drugs yeah okay well if you don't know much more about it yeah that's, no that's, but, that's, but, that's but, about the yeah. extent of my knowledge <laughs> <laughs> also ketamine is like a horse tranquilizer like the yeah anyway apparently it's it's something that's you know administered and uh, you know under you know the direction of a medical professional mm-hmm. yeah it is safe yada yada yeah. yada i don't know that much about it either yeah, like so. also yeah. disclaimer i'm not a medical professional exactly but, so yeah. could be interesting yeah. you know obviously they need to do a lot more research could yeah. be interesting from the perspective of if you look at uh let's say ssris 
Yeah. Again, I know nothing, but if you look at those, those are, from my understanding, mm-hmm. uh, that they're about like limiting certain feelings or like so controlling levels of There's whatever. actually nothing, like when we talk about medication to reduce emotionality or change emotionality, there's no way to actually like target one emotion. There's no pill that's going to make you less angry. It'll lessen all of your emotionality. So you end up being... Maybe you're less sad, maybe you're less depressed, but you're also less excited about other things. You have less sexual desire, sexual arousal. You lose interest in other things, but maybe you feel less sad, which for a lot of people is really helpful. But in the long term, you start to miss out on those other things that you were lacking. Right. But my my, I'm kind of like comparing the two in that maybe maybe the idea with um, psychedelics is that rather than like all right take a psychedelic dampen your feelings or Mm -hmm. whatever it's actually like look at your feelings in a different with a different perspective Mm -hmm. i assume that that's kind of the idea i think like from my understanding um ketamine is like dissociative so like you look at it from a from like a third person kind of perspective uh psilocybin i don't really know what Mm -hmm what that results in but that could be the advantage of those is just like changing your perspective versus like dampening i would say from like my perspective doing therapy Mm -hmm. right is that again you don't need anything air quotes to be different or feel different you need to be okay and so why do i need a psychedelic to understand my emotions differently because i'm not going to be on psychedelics all the time i'm going to ideally right i'm gonna just be myself and so actually while it may be helpful you're not really going to be understanding it from your everyday experience so in the long run it's not like a fix but i still think it could be interesting yeah yeah i I don't i've never done mushrooms but i was just more curious about the Mm -hmm. the effects or what the studies are saying because it's fairly new but people have been have been taking mushrooms on their own time and like uh, the disclaimer again, I'm not a medical professional, and I just I you can't get shrooms from this guy. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that makes me uh, wonder how 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 long has like therapy been a practice? Oh, therapy as a practice, it just depends on what you're talking about. Are you talking about like modern day psychotherapy, like sit in an office and speak to someone? Sure, well, that just goes back to like Freud is like the first one who starts to do that with any real like uh consistency um what what when was freud around what 18 late 1800s okay so freud's the og in terms of like sitting sitting speaking someone freud is different like he you had to sit behind and the patient had to lie down and it was basically he was like the voice of god which is a lot um the lying down that is that like a practice like I, I see that in movies um and, like people who practice psychoanalysis still or even psychodynamic forms of therapy may still do that okay there's like like i could kind of see the usefulness and like if i'm not moving my face it's again a way of having someone non-judgmental mm-hmm. um speak to you but on the other flip side of it i can't see your face so we're so like they're like right we're lying down right now yeah know? like we're like i had before i was like i gotta look over <laughs> yeah. at you because i can't see you right Um, but like therapy in and of itself has been around long before that people used to go to priests people used to go to friends people used to go to lots of different uh other professionals to receive and still do go to lots of different uh, professionals to get different types of therapy you should do like a therapist in cars (laughs) getting coffee (laughs) (laughs) therapist in cars getting psilocybin yeah (laughs) (laughs) hey now that's a show that's a show that's like a (sighs) copyright that one yeah Somebody's going to do it. Okay. So it's people have been practicing therapy, yeah. but it really only became this more kind of official guideline based practice. Yeah. You know, and practice. like it starts with Freud and Freud wasn't a psychiatrist and it really then uh, he would, he was practicing psychoanalysis and then he came to the States and like was training people. And then uh, psychiatry started to take it over and say, no, it's a, medical discipline uh and freud actually fought very much against that that no like emotion essentially like emotions not a disorder uh was also probably a perspective that he may have held Mm. um but didn't think that it should be medical doctors because it's not an affliction of the body 
So does that make you a big Freud? You a big Freud guy? No. <laughs> oh, okay. Like there's lots of stuff he talks about that is yes relevant, but when he talks about like you want to kill your uh, dad and have sex with your mom, uh, no. <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait, you guys don't feel like that? No. Um, oh. Like like he's onto something, and that there is like the love that you experience at home growing up is the love that you like seek out later on in life. Like there's a reason why you're attracted to people. Uh, some people versus others and the thing that you're attracted to is like that feeling of home that you get around that person the person makes you feel safe that makes you feel like the love that you experience it's not saying that you want to have sex with your mom or your dad and kill the other one <laughs> that <laughs> that's is pretty a bit like, much <laughs> <laughs> it's rudimentary thinking yeah. for yeah. sure and like he talks about the unconscious and was first one like in terms of like psychology to talk about that unconscious urges unconscious desires right which yes we have an unconscious that we have different drives and motivations that maybe we're not aware of okay so if you're not uh freudian a freudian yeah freudian freak um <laughs> do you have like a guy or girl yeah, like how's the industry? You know, like how fashion? Like, oh, this is the big fashion. It's like, yeah, who's the who's, hot, who's the, who's the hot, hot shot uh, right now? Like the big thing is DBT, dialectal behavior therapy. It was developed by Marshall Linen. There's CBT, which is Aaron Beck, who only Co uh, CBT is co cognitive cognitive behavioral, behavioral therapy. therapy. Yep. There's <laughs> ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy. Um, there's MBCT, mindfulness based cognitive behavioral uh, M. BCT, mindfulness-based cognitive behavioral therapy. Oh God, so, um, many. so many like T's. attachment therapy. There's uh, what's what I'm looking for. DMT. Uh, there's <laughs> no, <men> <laughs> there's mentalization-based therapy. Um, there's compassion-focused therapy. That was Kristen Neff. Yeah, the list goes on and on and on and on. There's lots of different therapies. Do you and, have one that stands out to you that? Um, I pull your North from Star. Uh, like all of them okay. really to like uh, to give people the tools they need and that's how I've been trained okay um what what's your take on movie and tv oh they're the worst I'm assuming therapists. you're gonna say therapists yes yes they're so bad they're always sleeping with their patients which <laughs> oh my god because <laughs> well, Johnny you wanted to ask about you know, there's a there's famous uh, famous uh, therapy sessions like Tony Soprano. I haven't seen The Sopranos. Oh, oh you gotta watch I The Sopranos. How about Donnie Darko? Never seen Darko. Donnie Darko. <laughs> like, hey, yes, it does happen where therapists sleep with their patients, and then they get their license removed. Yeah, and then they get like <laughs> the order of psychologists go back every couple of months, publishes like their info letter. It comes and every psychologist get one if you're on the rules, um, and it's like advertisements for different courses and different like articles about information about relevant things to practice and then at the back it's basically the the orders um gossip column um <laughs> there's a list of all the people who recently got their license so it's a long list of people who applied and got it there's people who are for psychologists for um occupational therapists for all these different uh, people mm -hmm. um there's people who are like retired or who passed away who are giving up their license it's like announced and then there's the other page of people who have been reprimanded and what they've been reprimanded for oh and really it has oh their, it, it has their name oh that's juicy it has the dates it has like what happened wow yeah full transparency yeah yeah, yeah. and good. like no one else cares about it except psychologists we, that's hilarious that's funny and like it kind of works. It's like it's like, hey, don't do it because it's gonna be like printed for everybody to see. But also, don't do it. Don't sleep with patients. I mean, uh, such an obvious thing. Yeah, but yeah, but, yeah, but it happens. So, it, like, what's the what's the worst thing about TV movie therapists? Is it that? Is it that they always sleep with their? It's that they sleep with their clients. It's that they like fundamentally misunderstand the person that they're speaking to. And yes, I know it's a, a TV show. Um, they or they're they're played off as like stupid or uncaring or unprofessional or just like plain wrong mm -hmm. <laughs> like very um clearly not written by someone who understands like clinical psychology practice right yeah which makes sense I mean, because I mean, yeah. it's a writer yeah, yeah. who like i'm nothing against writers <laughs> right but it's like you as a psychologist who spend uh, who spent like 
just PhD six years. Let's not even talk about undergrad, like more than a decade doing research and practicing with people like it's it's a fundamentally different understanding of people and their emotions than someone who's like writing and maybe looking up freud being like oh it's your unconscious desire to sleep with your mom and kill your dad like no (laughs) (laughs) i mean and obviously they have to write the therapist in a way where they're not actually necessarily really there to help the character Mm -hmm. they're kind of more like to have either uh, either what's the word uh, like character development come out yeah, yeah or like lead them in a direction that helps the plot so yeah it's almost like impo- well, not impossible to have like a good therapist I'm sure there could be a show that's like well this show is like uh, there uh, was one it was done on HBO called in treatment and it was actually really hmm. interesting um, they did it with a guy who's the player uh, the therapist and I can't remember his name off the top of my head but each day, it actually aired every day of the week, Monday through Friday. And Monday was a different uh, client that he saw in his office. Mm-hmm. And then Tuesday was a different client. Wednesday and Thursday was a different client. And then Friday was him uh, consulting, getting some supervision with one of his old um, mentors. So basically him having his therapy session kind of thing um, with her. And it aired every day of the week for like 45 episodes a season they did like three seasons of it damn and i remember watching it and i started watching it and it was good and then i think i got distracted with schoolwork and had to stop watching it but it was actually fairly good but that's and that's just to be clear like reality no it was uh it was scripted it's all scripted okay yeah and it's like the stuff that's going on in his life like with his wife as well um he's having like marital problems and like he's helping these couples who are married and have a miscarriage and uh one is this girl who i think he actually does end up like having a relationship with her um and it's <laughs> yeah do you see do you see like is the story solely told through the therapy sessions or do you yes. see them like going around no no it's like solely told told through the therapy sessions okay. and it's like consistent like this is the day i see this person which is in reality how it happens in my life when therapy like i only see the person in the hour that i have them which like therapy people talk about like oh i'm in therapy therapy doesn't actually happen in the session therapy happens outside of therapy Mm. you'll get the tools and that that hour or contact you have with that person and you'll manage things differently talk about how to manage things differently but the therapy is actually your life and applying the stuff Right, it's from like yeah. meeting, everything that happens in between, yeah. and then the next meeting. Right. Yeah, like one of the things, again, and stolen from another supervisor is like, I don't have a magic wand. I can't change what you're feeling. I have no control over you. I wish I did. It'd make, actually make my life easier. But like, you're in charge of your life. You're in the driver's seat. I'm in the passenger seat. I have the roadmap, but you're the one who's driving. Mm. Mm. And it's up to you to drive from this class to the next. Yeah. <laughs> Do you have any, do you feel like you have any weird feelings that you deal with? For example, you know, I spoke about like misophonia, right? Mm-hmm. That's something that I've dealt with. That's something that I mm-hmm. struggle with. That you've actually, you're the person, I think I mentioned it on the podcast. You're the person, you are the person who the I person. spoke to about <laughs> it and who helped me kind of like distance myself from mm-hmm. it and kind of help with it. So uh, for me, it's uh planes. Can't fucking stand them. Mm. I don't like flying. I didn't evolve from something with wings. I'm not meant to fly. Uh, (laughs) And it like, I completely become useless. Like Jacob has to take, I'm very much like, I manage lots of things. I like being in control. That's my shit. Um, But when it comes to travel, I lose my shit. Uh, Even the mention of like, oh, like what if we went to an all-inclusive? Like I shut down. I'm like, that means I have to get on a plane. Oh my God, I'm going to die. It's going to be bad. It's going to crash and burn. Uh, And so... Is the idea of the all-inclusive also that that's all figured out or it's just the plane no that's just like in the winter where it's like really freezing in Montreal and we want to go somewhere like an all-inclusive be nice don't need to do anything just go sit on a beach but I'm saying you're okay with an all-inclusive yeah that's no because you don't have to control the trip yeah 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 no whatever okay that doesn't bug me no it's the plane uh and so like 
next time I'm going to get a plane, I'm going to go and get a prescription because it's not fun for anybody. It's not fun for me. It's not fun for the people I sit with. It's not fun for Jacob who has to manage me. It's not fun for the flight attendants, although I typically make friends with them because I'm so anxious and I just get alcohol from them um, somehow. <laughs> and they're like, you're not in the section where we're supposed to like give you alcohol for free, but you're fun. So here. Right. Uh, and you're vibrating. So calm the fuck down. <laughs> um, <laughs> um, so like, yeah, like I talk about like medication often isn't the answer, but yeah, it's helpful in situations. It's not helpful super long term. That's what the research shows. Right. But like, yeah, an Ativan for when I, I got to get on a plane and manage. Yeah. Even though I know it's like a ridiculous thing to be afraid of. Like I have no control. I mean, not well, necessarily. Yeah, I got those feelings when planes are pretty plane. fucking terrified. Like I used to be terrified as well. I don't know. I just kind of like convinced myself. What I convinced myself is I have zero control here. Mm -hmm. And maybe there's something you feel too. I have no control. There's literally nothing I can do. I yeah. can't go and fly the plane. So me sitting here worrying and being scared, like literally does nothing. And I'd rather enjoy my flight. So I just decided to not feel bad about it. Yeah, no, I spend the entire time thinking the plane's going to crash. It's going to fall out of the sky. It's right. going to be bad. It's going to be bad. And you can't get out of that. Day. And like, uh, no matter what I do, no matter how I distract myself, and I will try. I will have a Nintendo DS and I'll be pay playing Pokemon uh, Sun and Moon, which has a way too long intro. I can never get past it. And so then I get distracted and then I try to watch something on the TV on mm -hmm. the thing and then it's not doing it enough for me. So I switch to my uh, iPod or my iPhone. Who has an iPod anymore? Uh, my iPhone and I listen to a podcast or I try to sleep or I try to eat or I got to pee and the kid behind my seat is kicking me. I'm just going through everything I did on our flight to London last time we went. And you can already tell that I yeah, you like feeling a little panic and anxious right I'm now? going real fast. Are you feeling anxious right now? That's the right biggest now? comment that I get from my students is that I talk fast, which is true, I do. Are you feeling, but are you feeling anxious right now? Just talking about it? Uh, no, I think it was just like getting ramped up and talking about okay. it. I do find it super interesting that uh, your solution is to take medication based Something off of Something that'll just knock me out. Right. Yeah. yeah. I guess I have to ask, mm. have you ever spoken to someone about this and like tried to like see that, that the problem with it? I haven't, but because I know what they're going to do. And like, this is the, this is like psychologist being the worst patients. Like mm. I know what they're going to do. I know how they're going to desensitize me to it. I know what they're going to say. I know when people are going to say, well, you're more likely statistically to be in a car accident than being a plane crash. Yeah. Okay, but you're probably statistically more likely to survive a car accident than you are to survive a plane crash. Because what are we talking about when we talk about car accident? We're talking fender bender? Are we talking like <laughs> Jaws of Life? <laughs> what are we talking about? But here, okay, yeah. so so that so that's how you feel, right? You're like, I feel like I already know what they're going to do. So mm -hmm. okay, but the the, the truth is, mm -hmm. you don't know what they're going to do. Oh, I know what they're going to do. No, but you don't know. Yeah, I do know. But it hasn't happened. So what if it's something that that surprises you because the typical method to manage uh fear of planes there's a program at the um trudeau airport um you like get desensitized to it you go on the plane while you're sitting like sitting there to manage the anxiety i don't have actually any anxiety about getting like the the plane itself isn't scary to me right it's the flying, i have no the flying the and dying flying and yeah i have fresh. no reaction to the plane <laughs> yeah like no matter how much information you're gonna give me about the plane right the is that it's not going to help. I had someone who I've worked with before came and said, to, and who said like, hey, I have to go on a plane trip and I want to talk about it. And I'm like, Oh God, oh, I have to manage my own <laughs> shit to manage this. And uh, like, I figured out a way to manage it because right. I can regulate myself in the moment when I'm working with someone and also come up with some pretty valid methods of managing it. Right. And it's something that I clicked for me and I was able to help it apply. to other, um, areas for other clients other patients is that like the, the thing that everyone struggles with is that we can time travel not in reality we don't have time travel boxes we can time travel in our mind it's a superhuman power that we have you can go back in time and remember shit that happened mm -hmm. and that sucks actually wait before it sucks it's really helpful because oh i have to remember when i go uh, to make that recipe because I did it last time. I forgot to get peppers. So I got to sure, remember to get peppers this time. Mm -hmm. I can remember shit in the past and I can plan for the future. You're the future over here, Johnny. Um, <laughs> Why I, am I the past? I don't know. Because I do think about the past, past a lot. Past like is over here. I'm very nostalgic. Um, it's just the way I orient it. And for the future, 
like it's really helpful okay i'm gonna plan next week i have to be there at this time and i got this appointment on this date so make sure i do that right it's actually like a really helpful power we have but when it comes to our emotions it fucks it up because you can remember shit that happened in the past that really fucking sucked that is not okay that it happened but Mm -hmm. that it did happen and when you remember it you react as if you're happening it's happening now and then you suffer again our emotions are not compatible with that consciousness that idea of me that can travel through time right yeah and so oftentimes what we do with the past i fixate on that thing oh my god i can't believe that thing happened it's so bad that happened it's so shitty that x happened why couldn't y happen or z happen or w or v or u or t Mm -hmm. why couldn't those things happen and acceptance is actually no those things didn't happen and it couldn't have happened differently why couldn't it have happened differently because it's done and dusted and happened and written and you can't fucking change it even though it sucks that thing happened and we can't change it no matter how much you want no matter how much you want to use your imagination to imagine all the scenarios of how it could have gone different yeah you literally yeah. can't acceptance is that one thing happened not those other things the future you can change the oh future. we have a tendency though to do the opposite we fixate on a is going to happen a is going to happen yes. it's going to be so bad oh my god the plane is going to crash it's going to be so bad it's going to be horrible no 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 i'm going to go my therapist they're going to tell me this yeah. they're going to yeah. tell me Just live in the moment <laughs> but a might not happen actually b yes. could happen or c or d or yeah. e or f or g or alpha beta gamma delta That's... the whole different alphabet we do the opposite with past and future yeah and the solution is also opposite with the future you have to diversify the things that could happen Mm. with the past you have to accept Essentially, that, that one yeah. thing can happen use the happen. use the past as a way to learn mm-hmm. use the future, future as like opportunity to grow and to grow, grow and change but live in the present live, yeah because that's where you're right at. now we can't change shit that happened in your life up until the exact moment in time i don't know what time it is right now everything has happened to you tim and you johnny and me elliot in my life at, until until this moment at 8 45 p.m couldn't be different because if it could have been different it would have been different but it wasn't so i mm-hmm. guess it had to be that way future is not written that shit can be different but as long as you're fixating on that bad thing that might happen you're probably going to lead to that bad thing happening because oh my god i got to give that presentation at work oh my god it's gonna be bad it's gonna be bad it's gonna be bad mm-hmm. i'm gonna forget what i'm gonna say i'm gonna stutter and everyone's gonna think i laugh at me and it's gonna be bad and then the day comes you gotta do the presentation and you're so anxious and oh my god i can't remember what i'm thinking about and then the bad thing happens oh Wow, we could just, I think the I thing think is, we're gonna be okay, John. Yeah, yeah. I think we're all gonna be. We're okay, all gonna be yeah. okay. Um. <laughs> well, Elliot, oh, that was that was very very fun. Yeah, wow. <laughs> you sound so enthused. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that was great. It's really nice yeah. to have you know our first guest of the season. Mm, first guest know? of the season. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Thanks for, lying. for uh, teaching us. Oh. Thanks for lying down between us. Yes. Yeah, it was fun. And feeling some weird feelings with mm-hmm. us. I hope you hope you enjoyed it. I did. Hope you felt like you're going to be okay as well. Yeah, yeah. I'm good. We're all going to be I okay. Know, I, all right, I, I, good. I am okay, so I'm good. So we're all, we're all okay. okay. We're all okay. But I'll check in on you guys. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think we're going to need you to come back. <laughs> come back. Our bi-monthly check-in. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Comment. What did you think of the episode? Uh, give Elliot a like or yeah. not whatever works for you because you're okay as well yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but we need your likes and subscribes follow us on instagram subscribe on youtube if that's where you're at if you're on spotify or something else click the other thing listen. i think it's the listen <laughs> button or rate and review tell your friends stuff. your family your grandma yeah all right all right well that's it for another episode of Weird, Weird Feelings. Oh, we didn't sing a song. Uh, oh, for another time. For another so, time. Sing us a song, Elliot. Close uh, it off. <laughs> that was fun. <laughs> I did Tina Belcher. <laughs> All right. Bye. Bye. Bye.